so we talk about being vulnerable. Our brothers are vulnerable right now <laughs> for two reasons. One, I'm awfully nervous. I don't know why. Like it hit me. I was sitting back there, maybe because there were such great speakers before. I was awfully stressed. But the other thing is I do 45-minute keynotes, and I have 15 minutes to pull this off. So um, I'm going to do my best. I'm a southerner and talk quickly anyway. But I'm going to use this opportunity to really talk to you and talk with you about something that I'm incredibly passionate about these days. And it is the hiring of the incarcerated, the formerly incarcerated. And in fact, it's not exactly a slip up. We're actually talking about taking work inside of jails and prisons so that work, because work matters. But before I get to that, what I want to do is tell you, when I began talking about this, I had a good friend from high school call me, at college rather, called me up, did my undergraduate university of Miami, the U, yes. And I gave him a call, he called me up and he said, Johnny Taylor, is that you on television, in the news, in newspapers? Are you talking about the formerly incarcerated? That's not the Johnny Taylor I know. First of all, and, and for two reasons, he said, first of all, you are an unapologetic capitalist. I don't understand. This is not your thing. You're supposed to be talking about making money. I spent my career working for three billionaires, Wayne Heisinger being the first, as we built 300-store blockbuster into 9,000-store blockbuster. And then we won't talk about what happened after us because we were gone. Um, <laughs> I was gone way before that. But then we left him, went to go work for a guy by the name of Sumner Redstone, may have heard him, worked for Sumner at Viacom as we grew that company and ended up with another billionaire, Barry Diller. So he said, I don't understand why you're talking about the formerly incarcerated. This isn't your thing. He said, but secondly, if I recall, your first boss was Janet Reno. <laughs> and those of you in the room, right, became the U.S. Attorney General, the first female Attorney General of the United States. When you were at a major law firm, that's who you worked with. You're tough on crime. So this doesn't, there's this major disconnect, misconnect, and I'm trying to understand what this is all about. And I don't know if any of you have had those moments. I had done well. I made money. Wayne was really smart. We got in and out at the right time. And then it, Sumner bought us, bought at the wrong time because he bought us at our high and then we sold it. And then you went on to, <laughs> those of us capitalists know the game, right? But at the end of the day, <clears throat> I wanted more. I wanted more, and I didn't know where more was going to come from in my life. But let me tell you what happened. True story. I'm going to a meeting. I've taken on this job as the CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management. We have 300,000 members in 165 countries. In fact, I just came back from our Dubai office. We have offices in India, China, big global outfit based in Washington, D.C., and it's a trade association, and life is good. But I still am wondering what else is there for me to do in this thing called life. I'm relatively young, and I want to do something else. Well, it's funny how God just brings it to you, right? So I'm in Union Station, live in Washington, D.C. I walked up to Union Station after getting off of the metro, and I'm sitting here. I'm a few minutes early because my meeting starts in an hour. I'm going to meet with a group of CEOs, and we're going to talk about human capital strategies. The meeting has two parts. They're going to talk about uh, customer engagement and then employee engagement. Great, so I'm the customer, the employee engagement guy. I have to get there in about an hour. I'm early. I'm sitting there on the second floor, and I, re I vividly remember this moment because this is how I got into this work and how it became my passion. I'm watching a young man. He walked up to the Ann Taylor store, the Ann Taylor loft or whatever, in Union Station, if you know it, and I'm sitting here watching him. He looks at me, and in a second, he runs into the store and grabs three or four items off of the counter. They were baskets of items, sunglasses, you know, women's, uh, what do you call this? all sorts of stuff. He just grabbed them and ran out of the store. And I, of course, sat there just disgusted. I could not believe that a human being in the middle of the day, forget, I guess you don't do it in the middle of the night either, but why are you stealing? This is a horrible thing. And he looks at me as he goes out and he says, shh, the hell? <laughs> That's reason for me to yell, right? Help! Um, I don't say a word for some reason because I believed him when he said, shh, there was something about it. Okay, fine. Um, he goes off. And 30 or so minutes passed. I'm really bothered. I walked into the store to make sure that the women who were working the store were okay because I knew they were traumatized because, hell, I was traumatized. And I knew it all. I saw it all company, happening. So fast forward. I'm walking down the street, and I run into him. True story. And I get my moment. All of us have that moment in life when we have to make a moment, uh, make a point. And I walked up to him, and I said, brother, why would you do that? I said, you're making it hard for the rest of us. I was mad as hell, to be totally honest. 
And he looked at me and he said, you don't judge me. He said, I have three kids at home. He said, and I can't feed them. He said, I have a bachelor's degree from Johns Hopkins University. He said, and I made a mistake early on in my career. I lost my job. I was incarcerated. I lost my family, and I've served my time, but you all, and I was like, I don't know who you all is, won't hire me. I've applied time and time and time again, and I've got to take care of my family just like you've got to take care of yours. So don't judge me. It's like, wow, <laughs> okay. And it really put me back on my feet because I thought about it. I was still pissed because I, I realized that he traumatized those people and he stole something that just didn't work for me. You know, I'm a capitalist. These people out here earning their money, trying to make business in retail, and you're stealing, and this is just all wrong. Well, I walk onto my meeting. We get there. I'm meeting with a group of the sort of august CEOs. There are about 250 big CEOs, some nonprofits, some major profits, some, you know, association CEOs like myself. And the entire conversation was about the lack of talent in Washington, D.C., the fact that our country has 7.3 million openings and 6 million people looking for jobs. The fact that unemployment is at a 50-year low, 3.9%, in all of the major categories, black folks, Latinos, everybody is enjoying this. I mean, there is work for everyone. And I can't tell you guys, I was sitting there saying, except people like that man. It just, it tied to me right that moment. Here we are saying we don't have talent. We have a labor shortage, and then within that labor sh shortage, exacerbated that by that, we have a skill shortage, and then we've got these people over here. Some 650, 750,000 people a year are released from America's jails and prisons. And I said, so if we've got this 1.3 million person deficit, people who want to work, there is a disconnect. So I walked home that day. I literally walked home all the way. I live in Capitol Hill, so it wasn't forever. It was about half a mile. But I walked because my mind was really bothered by this all. At the end of the day, what I realized was we've got to do something about this. And so the quick part of it is I realized this was bothering me because this was a win, 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 win situation. It was a win if everyone, if we get hiring the incarcerated right, Industry wins. Industry says they need people. Here are 750,000 people a year who are going to be released from jail. Secondly, taxpayers win. If we talk $35,000, $45,000 a year to house someone, and that's if they're well, if they have problems, if they have medical conditions, what have you, we have another problem. Taxpayers win if we get these people back to work. The people and their families win. That was the thing that really dawned on me. When that guy looked at me and said, don't judge me, it really resonated. It scared me, but he was right. He wins, and then finally, society wins. We're always talking about a safer place, a safer society. Well, this is how you achieve it. When everyone gets what they want out of this situation, that's nirvana, and that's an opportunity. Who better than me to do it? I run the world's largest HR association, 300,000 people who often are the gatekeepers. We are the reason why CEOs who say they will hire the formerly incarcerated don't. And we don't because we say it's right, but in reality, we have all of our biases. And they're not unconscious, they're conscious. We ask on the application, have you committed a crime? It could have been 20 years ago. And you could have paid your debt to society and actually have done well, and we still have a bias. And so I've become almost an evangelist for this work. I'm understanding that we need to do good and do good. And for those of you all, I'm sitting back at the table with Ben, the English professor. I know that's grammatically incorrect. Do well and do good. But at the end of the day, it's simpler. We need to do good and do good, and hiring the formerly incarcerated is an opportunity for us to do it. And if someone like me, a law and order guy, can get past his own biases, then all of us in this room have to really ask ourselves. Think about, these people have made mistakes. Every one of us has made mistakes. I loved in the beginning, we had people standing up. I loved it, of course, I'm the HR guy, the former labor and employment lawyer, and he said, who here has dated at work? I saw you all, I took pictures. <laughs> I wanna send that out, I was like, okay. So if we took a chance, the only difference between, the reason you aren't on the front page right now is you didn't get caught. I mean, at the end of the day. And these people did, seriously. So this is something that I've gotten passionate about. I want us all to talk about. So then you ask me, okay, so what do you do? I'm passionate about it. I become involved. I want to 
find opportunities for the formerly incarcerated. In our shop, we have 500 employees in Washington, D.C., as I said, some in India. And I called all of my hiring managers and said, let's look for opportunities. Let's hire people. Let's test yourselves. And I was tested because a guy came into my office applying for a position. I can't even tell you. It's a really kind of funny story. But at the end of the day, he applied for the position, got the position. I was walking through the hallway. And I said, I know you from somewhere. And he looked at me like, I know you from somewhere. I'd seen him on America's Most Wanted the night before. No, American Greed, American Greed. True story, he was working in our shop and he was so afraid that we were gonna fire him because the CEO now knows that he has you know, a criminal background. The reality is I was being tested and each of you are gonna be tested, but you gotta commit to hiring these people. You got 750,000 people every year, returning, returning citizens as we're referring to them, who need opportunities and we need people like you in this room to look at the man and the woman in the mirror and realize that you too have made mistakes, you just didn't get caught, and give them a second chance. So, why am I here today? I, one, I don't do 15-minute speeches, and secondly, I was just in our Dubai offices, so I literally got off a plane and got back on a plane. I went home to spend the day with my eight-year-old daughter for Easter, and I'm back here with you all now. I'm here because a friend of mine, and I hope he's here, Mark Christensen. Mark, are you in the room? Mark called me. And he said, Johnny, I can see your passion about all of this work, this work about the formerly incarcerated. And he said, you've got to tell more people about it. I said, I tell 300,000 people a day. We run commercials. We do everything. He says, no, you need to come to this organization because I think you have full alignment with them. And so I went online. I'd never, I'll be honest, I'd never heard of conscious capitalism. I was not, a, she said, what? <laughs> all right, I'm down to amen corner down here. I'm a southern, I feel good now. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, I had not heard of it, and I didn't know what it was about. But the second I pulled up the site, at Mark's suggestion, I saw it. It says, we believe that business is good, ethical, noble, and heroic. That sold me right away. And I said, we've got to figure out how to take that back to my organization, the Society for Human Resource Management, and we've got to embrace that. And so we are a wonderful organization. We make a lot of money. We, you know, we, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue. Life is good. We've never had a bad year. A bad year is we don't make our budget by more than 10%. I mean, it's a wonderful business to be in. And for those of us who are capitalists, like I said, unapologetic capitalist I am, but we need to do more. So I sat down with my team and I said, what else can we do? We make money. We've got money. What else can we do to really establish purpose and a platform for the work that we do? Got it that we all like to make a lot of money and we need to, we need to, you got to make money to give money, right? So got it, check. But the real opportunity for us is to figure out how can we do what we do, which is make better workplaces and also make a better world. And that was the challenge. So my management team and I sat down. I've only been in this job for a year as the CEO. And I said, guys, let's come up with something that really captures who we're going to be as an organization and who we want our workers to be. There are 115 million people working in the businesses that our members service every day. So we have a heck of an opportunity. When you think about it, most of, your, I, most of the time that you're awake, you're at work. And so if we can take this and begin to change the narrative and get people to understand, if we can walk the talk, begin to hire the formerly incarcerated, it's going to make a big difference in the world. And this has become a rallying call for our employees. But let me tell you something, and our members, but let me tell you something, the devil's always working, right? My grandmother would always say, there's always something amiss. And let me tell you what happened. I announced with Charles Koch, Richard Branson, and myself, we fly out to the Coke Network seminar January, this past January, we do this big announcement because there's been the First Step Act that President Trump signed into effect in December, into law in December, and I said, First Step is fine. You're gonna release 750,000 people, but then what are they going to do? If they can't find jobs, they're going back. And recidivism is a major problem for us. So SHRM is gonna take on the task of ensuring that we start something else, not the second step. The lawyers told me someone else had bought that, but we have to get talent back to work. So we started a major initiative, announced with myself, Charles, Richard Branson, we all got on stage and said, we're now gonna get America, these Americans back to work. Gettingtalentbacktowork.com, if you get a chance, it's a toolkit that we prepared for your organ people like you and your HR folks, and if you don't have an HR function for you to go in and we give you tools so that you know how to do this work. So we did it, we launched it, everything, literally the week after it occurred, front page of the newspapers, um, the Illinois shootings, Aurora shootings, and it was a gentleman who had been formerly incarcerated. 
So I got trashed. I'm going to tell you now, I mean, they handed it to me. News media were saying, are you changing your position now? Do you think the formerly incarcerated need to come work here? Do you think I need to expose my employees to this risk? It got ugly. But I was reminded, as I conclude, I was reminded of conscious capitalism and our alignment. It's good, it's ethical, noble, and it's heroic. And we said, listen, people make mistakes. And this gentleman will pay for the mistakes that he's made. But this does not let you off the hook. There are 750,000 Americans a year who need a second chance. And all of us need to be willing to give them that opportunity. So that's what we're committed to. Sherm literally is going to make the world better through better workplaces. And I'm here to ask you all to join us in that movement because this is a way that each of you can change someone's life and their family's lives. Thank you. Thank you.